and perfect. So now we're officially live. Uh, I'm super excited to be here today. Um, the Venture City and three portfolio companies. Um, and yeah, before we start getting into it, just a very brief background on who we are, the Venture City. We're a venture fund investing in product focused companies, investing from pre seed to Series A across three regions um, Europe, US, LATAM. Um, and today I'm super excited to chat with three of our portfolio companies about today's VC landscape and your own experiences. And, you know, excited to hear what you're building. Um, we'll talk about also the state of funding, which obviously this last quarter. Uh, made definitely some headlines. Um, and to guide the conversation, I'm referring back to a VC benchmark report, a report that the Venture City is publishing every quarter with the state of funding um, and just insights on what that means to founders as well as VCs. Um, before I start with the introductions to the three panelists that you see here, I'd like to highlight three things that stand out of the report. Um, first thing is really the slowdown in funding. I mean, everyone here on this call is in venture, I believe, and connected to founders, maybe a founder yourself um, or an investor or somehow related to the tech scene. Um, and it's very clear that we've seen a contraction of funding. Um, in fact, the second consecutive quarter now, um, it was like 30% 30 30 decline from last, last year, so Q4 2021. But I wanna say here that I have some good news because we actually looked into the capital raises from funds from the last few years to see how much money is still yet to be deployed. And we can estimate that there's around 40 billion, more than 40 billion uh, of dry powder available in the market. So, you know, for all the founders out there, there is money that will be deployed over the next years. Um, second thing is geographies are being hit differently. Um, and that's why I'm excited. We have like representatives here from all three regions, Europe, US, LATAM, um, the US, had obviously a big decline, but still represents 70% of all VC funding. Um, Europe seems to be the most insulated and um, actually the numbers weren't as bad as for the rest of the world. Um, LATAM was hit the hardest, but we also know that founders in this market are no stranger to volatility. So, um, you know, excited to hear from Manu later about, about this. Um, and then the third point from the report is that we noticed that as a response to the slowdown in funding, we saw a lot of other venture firms that um, provided resources. So YC, uh, they published a letter to its founder, Sequoia published a deck, Craft Ventures put out a YouTube video. And at the Venture City, we actually shared a crowdsourced document with advice from other founders how to navigate the bumpy market. Um, we're going to share this here as well in the chat, um, which I think is great because it's founders like you um, that have shared different advice on how to navigate the bumpy market. It's still available at your disposal um, and yeah, feel free to share. Okay, so those were three highlights. I wanted to make sure that the slowdown in funding, we still think, you know, see the, the silver linings and that um, we we're still excited about building. But now I would love to, for the panelists to introduce yourself. Um, maybe we'll start with um, Shail as someone who's building the first board game console. Please introduce yourself, what you're building, where you're dialing in from and where you're, where you're based in your company. 
Absolutely. So hi, my name is Shale Mehta. I'm the CEO and founder of Game Board. I want everyone to think Netflix meets Kindle for board games, tabletop games, everything from cards and dice games all the way to Dungeons and Dragons. So when you turn on Game Board, it's like Netflix. You have access to hundreds, if not thousands of experiences of tabletop. You click on whichever game you want to play, the Game Board becomes it. And then our patented technology allows for you to use real game pieces on the surface. So if you have Monopoly pieces, um, Catan Robber, Dungeons and Dragons minis, you can use them on the surface. Um, you can fit as many pieces as the game allows. We're truly building a bridge between physical and digital play. So we're based out of Denver um, and we're just now getting out of beta. Hardware, um, Our hardware is done. We're like releasing hundreds of units to consumers. Literally as we speak, they're building right outside the door. Um, and do you want us to also talk about how much we've raised as well? Sure. Um, so we've, uh, Game Board is, uh, has raised from this moment about 8 million to date. Um, and we did our seed round last year with TBC that led it as well. And then we just finished a bridge round in the middle of all this madness. Wow, congrats. Thank you. It's well done. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so happy to have you here. And as uh, someone who's based in Denver, like you're the one that will talk about the US um, and like US founders. Alberto, love to go to you. Um, you're dialing in from a car. Where is that car? <laughs> Somewhere in Europe. So, yeah, in Stockholm, Sweden, and right in front of the football field where my son is is playing soccer now. So, Found entrepreneurs, a yeah, we had to we had to be entrepreneurs. We need to lead the companies, but we need to be mothers and fathers as well. Yeah, hundred percent, awesome. Please introduce your company, what you're building, and you know any funding history. Very good. Yeah, uh, I'm the co-founder and, and CEO of PlexiGrid. At PlexiGrid, we are building the operating system for the electricity grid of the future. Okay, uh, electricity grids were designed 100 years ago for a very different energy system in which you uh, power a country with a very limited amount of centralized, large, uh, controllable power plants. If you think about the energy transition, it's exactly the opposite. You have hundreds of thousands of distributed, non-controllable uh, solar and wind plants. And on top of that, there is a revolution on the demand side of the grid because the decarbonization of our economies involve electrification. So now, well, you need to electrical power uh, all the transport sector. For example, in Europe, um, we put uh, two, 2035, that's the last uh, uh, petrol car shipped. It will be 100% electric. Uh, in the US, you have this uh, Inflation Reduction Act that effectively will put millions of heat pumps, uh, solar panels, um, uh, and all these things are power hungry and the grid was not built for that. And so we are developing a network technology for network operators that that uh, allows them to, to integrate all this new energy reality in, in an efficient manner. Um, I always put them um, in telecom, there's been a transformation, you know, 40 years ago, uh, it was, you know, local monopolies that ran analog copper uh, fixed telephony lines. That was a telecom. And now you have 5G, you know, so there were some innovation in between. Uh, in the meantime, electricity companies have gone from analog copper to more copper. And, you know, this is getting to a breaking point where this, this is no longer sustainable. So, yeah. Amazing. This is yeah, Love it's quite cool. Actually. What you're building and um, energy has been your jam for a while. I know you've been in the space for more than a decade. So, um, yeah, two decades. Yeah, most of that in renewables. Uh, uh, and all the way through, we always saw the grid as the bottleneck, the biggest mm -hmm. bottleneck of the energy transition. So, at some point, we say, well, somebody has to do something about this. And well, right. why not us? Perfect. And very quickly, which stage are you in? Um, how much money have you raised? Uh, yeah, we 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 are in a, between uh, seed and Series A. Uh, we raised two million, uh, and now we are preparing our uh, A Series or bridge, which will be a uh, yeah very similar to you, maybe six seven million extra. Yeah, 
We are hoping to get a two and a half million euro grant, technology grant from the European Commission very soon as well, which is nice, not non-diluting. So yeah. Hundred percent. We like uh, cheap money, right? Like. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Awesome. So then Manu from Belo, uh, please introduce yourself. You've been in crypto for a decade, so excited to have you here. Yeah, sounds like an old guy already. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, being in crypto for the last 10 years, uh, co-founded several companies in, in these last uh, few years, did an exit also with my previous company, was, which was one of the first Bitcoin exchanges in LATAM. And in 2020, we started you know, with Belo, which is basically a new approach towards how people um, get into crypto and use it every day. Living in Latam, and more specifically in Argentina, it's really hard from the financial and economic perspective and giving people the opportunity to have a harder money on top of crypto without being, you know, no, uh, knowing a lot about uh, these financial products, it's really kind of our objective. I mean, our mission is to give uh, people control of their future, and we are working really hard towards that. Um, so we started with Belo one year ago. Actually, last week we it was our first anniversary. Uh, in this first year, Congrats. we thanks thanks for that. We grew uh really rapidly uh i mean when you see the growth of previous company to this one it's like uh mind-blowing we achieved to register 360,000 um users have 50,000 act monthly active users and growing in average you know 30 percent month over month uh all that you know uh Obviously, it was possible to a great team uh, of dedicated professionals, which are, you know, which are remote first, which is kind of also how we started, kind of how the pandemic impact on the way we work. Uh, right now, we, in, we are in diff five different countries, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, and Spain, and looking to expand into Mexico in Q4 this year, um, where we see, you know, the opportunity to scale uh, our business uh, much uh, higher um, in in relation to funding, we did a uh, one pre seed round in 2021 to do the first hirings. This year we closed a three million uh, seed round uh, where the venture capital enters and are really supportive on in all these process. And we are right now with a seed extension and trying to figure out because we have really good figures if we jump directly to maybe a series A, uh, given the fact that we, I mean, we are quite confident that uh, we are at that level, you know? So uh, that's kind of the, this, what where we are right now, you know? Amazing. Um, this is so great to hear, like all three of you um, seem to really weather the storm, um, but, you know, I'm excited to dive deeper into it because I'm sure, you know, as any founder, there's like ups and downs. And um, before I start with a couple of the questions, the audience at the end has time to ask a couple of questions that we'll pick. So please feel free to share those in the chat or in the Q&A uh, function here. And someone from the team will at the very end pull out a, a couple that are relevant that we'll ask. Um, also for anyone who just tuned in, um, so. We have three founders here from the US, LATAM and Europe, and we're using um, the VC benchmark report that the Venture City is publishing every quarter as a guide. Um, so I just also uh, posted it again here in the chat. So let's go into it. Um, we talked about the slowdown right now, but I would love to hear from all three of you how you have reacted now uh, you know it's been um a, a few months since the initial shock um where the markets are still shaky but we also see that there's some successful raises right we just heard the last game board raise successfully we have a few other portfolio companies um there's steady valuation so what are your thoughts and maybe we start with alberto um with Europe, because we know it fared the best. Uh, what are the sentiments in Europe? Well, I I think um, in a sense normality. I mean, people talk about okay, slowdown, but 
but not a crash. And uh, you know, our offices in Sweden are in Norgen. Uh, I think you have uh, another portfolio company there where we, we're neighbors. And there is one of the largest accelerators of, of startups in the Nordics. And I'm, I mean, I haven't seen big tragedies. I've seen entrepreneurs racing and closing rounds. Sure, maybe valuation has been affected a little bit, but uh, you know, I think it's uh, been different than than what we have seen in other regions and and uh, normality. I haven't seen big dramas or people are unable to raise and, and and so on. But on the other hand, before this crash, right? You, I mean, so, sometimes bubbles are created by some excesses, right? And then you have an adjustment in, in a sense. So. You know, maybe a couple of years ago, we saw some American startups with questionable technology. You know, we have better technology, raise some rounds in US that got us like this and say, how is that possible? You know, and 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 so, you know, I think we need to 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 make a difference. What is a crash and what is a readjustment, right? Readjustments are, in a sense, healthy for the whole ecosystem, you know, uh, if there has been excesses before. and. And to that extent, maybe Europe did less excesses than other regions. You know, that's why you have less adjustment now. That's a little bit my reading, uh, right or wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've talked about this in a similar way as like a market correction. Um, mm. But then looking at you, Shale, since um, like Alberto just mentioned, there were like obviously some companies that very publicly, you know, went down. Um, what were your reactions to that? And what are you talking to your founder friends about this? Like all of you have taken on VC dollars, meaning that, you know, you will have to raise um, over the next years. What are your thoughts? I, I think that the companies that we all kind of assumed would go bust are the ones that are going bust, to be really transparent. I think that you know, we, and we've touched on this and I, I know we're kind of, we'll get into it as well, but I think VCs um, tend to invest with trends, especially when markets are really high and there's a lot of capital flowing and they forget to focus on unit economics and how to truly scale a company. Um, and before a recession, before a pandemic, before all these things, and you know, we are companies that are built in adversity. So in order to not only be built in adversity to withstand adversity, takes a lot of takes a lot of insight into your product to make sure that it can withstand whatever is going to come next, right? So I always say to people, you know, we really launched right before COVID, right? End of 2019 was when we really launched. And then COVID hit, no one saw that. And now we're experiencing a downturn in the market. But given all these conditions, look at what we've been able to accomplish. Look at our metrics. Look at what we've been able to build. Look at the customers that we've been able to acquire. Even during a supply chain crunch and shortages in um, everything from silicon to you know, semiconductors to components, we're building and shipping product, right? You have to frame the question. One of the things that's very true in in the United States is that there is more funds deploying capital than there are founders trying to get capital. So you have to be very cognizant of who you're talking to and how you are framing the question, right? One of the biggest things that I get all the time is hardware is hard. I'm like, no, hardware is not hard. Every product is hard. It, do you have the team to know how to operate and change and withstand and evolve from things that happen within the market and external? And do you have a product that lasts with consumers ultimately at the end of the day, right before anything? So yes, the, I think companies are going bust, but I think those that didn't have good unit economics that didn't have the infrastructure to really withstand are the ones that are kind of going under. I think founders that are, have the foresight to pivot to when they need to and kind of understand how they need to get more capital or reduce burn, whatever they need to do, you have to figure that out. And you have to be very cognizant of the times that we live in because something else could go wrong next, next year, right? What are you doing to build a lasting product? Awesome, very well said. And I love that you're pointing out the metrics and just you know, really looking at unit economics and, and the data. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. So Manu, uh, talking about LATAM, I said earlier, it was a region that seems to be hit the hardest. But on the other hand, inflation and economic turmoil is, isn't anything new to most of the founders in your region. 
how do you see the impact for LATAM and, and for your business? So we are quite, uh, you know, used to having a hard time. Um, imagine that last, last month inflation was only last month was 6%. So um, we need to navigate these um, hard times all the time. Uh, I think definitely, I mean, the, over the last couple of years, uh, things kind of change and, and put LATAM in the focus in many for many VCs and, and many companies and was an, an explosive you know uh, new ecosystem which was really enrichment at some point uh, um, in which you know a lot of people could produce value and and, and wealth out of it. Um, I think in general, I mean as I mentioned, we are quite used to to uh, trying maybe to to work harder to get things uh, and can and I think that uh, I call it the, the the economy of scarcity at some point uh, mm -hmm. helps you think um, in a much more uh, better way in order to accomplish what you need to do and and in the startup scene or in the startup industry let's say scarcity. For me, it's a superpower, you know. So uh, trying to build things with nothing, it's kind of the actual magic uh, behind scenes, you know. Um, and and it's and I think that, that happened. I, I hopefully, I mean, in, in our case, and maybe given the fact that also I'm, I'm kind of a, a a boomer in the industry, I have many the, the chance to 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 raise some funds. Um, but in general, I think there is there is. I mean, obviously, the, definitely the ecosystem has dry up, dry up a little bit. But still, there is a lot of things going on and a lot of interest, you know, in in the region and in different companies. Um, which no, it's no. I think the hard thing, the hard thing about this is to uh, maintain relevant in time uh, and. Obviously, there is like you know seasons or cycles. The thing is how we can you know generate this um, a compose, a composability effect in which you know you become much more relevant all the time and really think about you know big problems that uh, go beyond the region and and become relevant you know also in the in the global VC and, and startup ecosystem. No? Yeah, I like how you you know already see it as like a broader issue and how you're not just looking at it isolated. And similar to Bello, I've read it's, you're saying it's something for everyone every day, right? Yeah. Um, do you mind like explaining a little bit just so that the audience will also understand kind of the width and the, the reach of your vision for Bello? Yeah. I, I think it's important to to also uh, maybe explain why this this change of approach. So and and this maybe it's really local problem. Maybe not. It's something that we need to somehow um, test the hypothesis. But um, in my previous company, we build up an exchange. So um, basically, liquidity the pipes for you know allowing users to get into crypto and, and, and have, you know, well, access to the asset and, 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 and build the liquidity around these platforms, which were, I would say, copycats of Wall Street. I call this Wall Street-like products in which we were pushing uh, users to start doing trading into platforms, which were similar to, you know, uh, exchanges, you know, stock exchanges, with the problem that, in, I mean, I have never traded stock in my life. So I was pushing to an experience which was pretty much unnatural for me. Um, and from my point of view, that created a stress. And on the other side, one of the, the things that I also detect was that in general, you were pushing people to, hey, you can buy crypto assets. And once I have it, say, okay, what is it for? I mean, it's, it's like a brick, it doesn't produce anything. And the thing that we change with Bell is not only we hack the onboarding, so in six clicks, you are about to buy your first crypto assets. 
it's really simple to do it. It's connected to your local payment infrastructure. So it's basically one bank or digital world more into the ecosystem, which also make it, make it more accessible and kind of uh, uh, erase this preconception that it's something in a drawer outside of your day-to-day. Yeah. And the fact that we build a product which you know allows you to save and get a yield on your assets. Uh, so this gives the idea that there's a value on, on buying that asset and the composability effect of having more every every day, every month. And the the, the last part, which is I think one of the, the the best hacks, which is quite naive in in a way, but you know, using a technology like a MasterCard provides tangi tangibility to something which is intangible. And people, when you give them a card, it was like, oh, so I can spend them. And it was like, you know, a total aha moment in which people suddenly understand uh, mm -hmm. that this is something that it's accessible for anyone, that they can, you know, provide a lot of value and they can use it every day. So that's kind of where you close the loop and suddenly you have a product which can be used by anyone. So. There is a lot of bias in people in general towards crypto saying this is not for me and obviously my my answer is why not uh and they say <laughs> i don't know <laughs> so kind of you know trying to rewire a little bit the, the brain of the the consumer in that sense yeah i love it how you're conditioning with something that they know already like the card um to introduce something new yeah. um so Shale, we were just talking about, uh, or you were saying you uh, started before the pandemic. Um, and then we obviously, during the pandemic, saw a massive surge in gaming and entertainment. Um, and now, since we're in this new normal, there are definitely a few new opportunities for growth. But we also saw some companies that maybe just benefited from COVID and you know are, are struggling now. Um, I would love to hear from you, like what are in your point of view, some of the be be behavioral changes that stick in, in this post COVID world and how do you plan to build? Like what's on your roadmap? What is some of your advice that you would give to other founders? I think one of the first things, and I touched on this a little bit, but to expand on it, I, is, the, is the product that you're building. And is, is the problem that you're solving something that was illuminated? Like, did it, was that problem illuminated more by COVID? Like, did it shed light to it more and people saw its value? But the underlying problem was always there, right? So when you have um, the workforce and how people work today and how people communicate today, these are underlying problems problems, right, that have existed before COVID. COVID accelerated them, shed a lot of light to them. A lot of companies experienced growth. Game board included in that during COVID because we were a gaming company. But the underlying problem stayed consistent, right? Before COVID, I used to go, you know, we have a platform. I used to go to tabletop publishers and developers and be like, hey, deploy your game onto game board. You know, I, you have an analog game, someone purchases Monopoly, they stick it on a shelf. You have no idea what happened when someone purchases a game, it's analog. Who played, how often did they play? Who did they play with? What games did they explore? There's no data on these analog physical games, right? They were like, get out of here. You're crazy. You're trying to cannibalize our industry. You're taking away our revenue. COVID hits, supply chain is bottlenecked, costs are at an all-time high, people are trapped in their house, demand is at an all-time high, and they can't deliver product. The underlying problem was always the same. Even after COVID, that problem stays the same, right? And it's our, I don't know if we're allowed to say COVID's over, but if it, I'm, I'm going to say it, <laughs> but it's, say it. I want to hear yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, now we have to focus on the market, but that underlying, that underlying condition is still the same, right? You still don't have the information to scale, to really grow, to understand your core audience. And as a consumer, the ability to have preferences of easy access is just getting more and more. Consumers today buy products based on how they make you feel, right? It doesn't matter the price of but how does it make you feel? What experience does it deliver? And this has been, again, accelerated by COVID and Gen Z. And I don't know what you're called after Gen Z, but whatever that generation is, it's been accelerated by a consumer that wants to feel good about 
what they're putting, not only in their body, but the products that they're buying, how they contribute. If you look at the three of us, right, you have crypto, you have energy, and you have gaming. These three trends will last well beyond any of our companies because they are fundamentally true to the inherent problems of our society. Are you building a product that is a flash of the pan that you're just trying to do some money? And that's fine. Or are you building an underlying infrastructure technology that solves a problem that can permeate throughout history? Those are two very distinct you know, use cases in that. You have to be true to, to who you are and what you're building always. And can it withstand that? So I always double down on that. What, what is your problem? And mm -hmm. can it resonate throughout different market conditions and pandemics apparently, and other global phenomenons that'll happen? What is that problem and who are you solving for? I love it. And I think that is true, not just for founders, also for VCs, right? It's like, yeah. stay true to the mission, to your thesis. Yeah. Um, and regardless of any of the macroeconomic uh, effects. Yeah. Um, if I then switch over to climate tech and Alberto, because if I now look at um, if there was any winner coming out of these last few months, I feel like it's climate tech. Um, Clean tech 1.0 in the 2000s were Kleiner and Kozla um, put billions into the sector. We didn't see that kind of big, you know, win coming out of it, or it was seen as a failure. Even though you know we can still pinpoint a lot of companies that were amazing coming out of that time. Um, but I would love to hear from you. Um, do you think now is the time? to break through for climate tech and why. Um, and also again, like from a European perspective, which sometimes, especially in sustainability and climate seems to be ahead of the US. So I'd love to hear your point of view. Yeah, well, I'm my point of view is of course biased because uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm a climate, uh, that's what I have done for a living, but a lot of things have changed, and to answer your question, I think yes, it's very strong momentum, and the timing is right now. Uh, 10, 20 years for many reasons, right? If you think about affordability, uh, 20 years ago, the cost of solar was uh, a factor of 30 times, right? Uh, we have seen 93, 94% cost reduction in, in solar power and wind power. So these things are no longer uh crazy expensive as a matter of fact is the cheapest way to produce power wind and solar now is so sun and wind is cheaper so so they are very okay i say can you hear me it says yes. you broke oh, up for okay. a second but we can hear you oh. now yeah. okay okay i'm back uh, well the we have 5G here, it should be quite quite good, but even even this sometimes fails. But um, but uh, so, um, yeah, so second, the, they are fundamentals. There is one thing is hype and another thing is fundamentals, right? Uh, when when solar and wind and renewables becomes cheaper than fossil fuels, well, that's that happened. It's a reality, it's not happening, you know, and then it's, it's obvious that why couldn't then we replace the whole thing from, from fossil base to renewables if, if it is not going to come at a premium. Of course, with renewables, you need to solve the storage, you need to solve this intermittency, you need to solve all these other things, you know, that, that technology can resolve. But, but you know, uh, that is a fundamental change between 20 years ago or now. And I've been working through and through all of this. The second is in Europe now is geopolitics and energy dependence. And, and countries start to realize that your sun, your water, and, and, and your wind is yours, right? And you don't need to be, depend from putting, being in a good mood or bad mood, opening or closing the, the gas tap. So, so this has taken an extra dimension, which is not only climate focused, but it's all about energy security and energy independence and self-sufficiency. And, and uh, your natural resources, you know, your sun, your, your wind, your water, you know. Uh, and then... Uh, I, well, you have seen the this summer, you know, uh, the and the costs, you know, because now you, we start to have transparency on the cost of climate change, you know, which is in the in the trillions, uh, and and so it's a fact. If an it's, it's an order of magnitude higher than than the investments you need to make to 
to avoid this uh, climate disaster, right? Like, uh, like I think this um, Bill Gates wrote the, this book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. And, and so I think there is a lot of things falling into place and uh, from, from different perspectives, right? The, the technology there is it's affordable. Uh, the things that need to be fixed, uh, I think, can be fixed. And, and, and we need to invest in technology. Um, the geopolitics, energy independence, you know, and and when you look at these different perspectives, you know, the, the answer is the same. Why not go for, you know, a full energy transition that that we get rid of these these things, right? Gas is bad for, for so many reasons, right? And and uh, yeah. And the key, you know, the key, which I think is what I love, uh, it, we shouldn't build this on subsidies. We should build this on, in an affordable way for consumers, right? Uh, so that for them transitioning from a normal car to an electric car doesn't come uh, at a premium, you know? That's what, I mean, Bill Gates also talk about these green premiums, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And he says adoption explodes when you eliminate the green, premium, the green premiums, right? So when you no longer have to pay a premium for consuming renewables or driving an electric car, why wouldn't you do it, right? And that's when you have the volumes exploding. And so, so I think the timing is now and, and we see more and more technologies eliminating these green premiums and scaling very rapidly. Yeah, I, I hope you're right. And I am also very optimistic, um, just given the fact that, to your point, that it's about the private markets, right? There is like the, the public and governments that obviously the new IRA bill in the US now comes into effect, which are very helpful. Uh, but hopefully it's like a combination of that, right? That all the pledges towards net zero from the corporates and then companies like yours that are really pushing, you know, for, for the faster innovation. Um, so fingers crossed and excited to follow that journey. Um, yeah. Also one more stat on that. We know that there's now, I believe almost 50 unicorns in climate tech, I think 47 and like half of them got, unicorn status last year. So um, I think seeing really that the time is now, that, that is really a good signal. Yeah, and, um, and I always just give a quick example. President Trump tried to stop all of this. He tried American Dick's call. I remember still the picture. He was pushing CEOs in energy companies in the United States to build more fire, coal fired power stations. Nobody did. Nobody did because they understood everyone, you know, he scrapped all Barack Obama uh, emission standards for cars. But still, if you see at Ford or General Motors, what are they doing? If you look at the R&D capital, what are they placing it into electrical vehicles, even through Donald Trump years, right? So there are certain fundamentals that even, you know, the, the most powerful president of the United States trying to reverse things and taking us back to the 1970s or something, uh, or to the 19th century or something, and, and he can't. I mean, even with all his full will, um, you can even see on, on those moments that this energy transition is something unstoppable. It's a mega trend that you can try to slow down or something, but to reverse, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite strong, you know. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. that's the great thing, the great timing right now. So I'm um, mm. excited to see this come to fruition. Manu, I, I know we have only a few more minutes left, but let's talk about crypto. I mean, crypto has been in the news outside of the general uh, market slowdown, um, and we've seen drop in prices, cases of fraud, massive depreciation of digital asset value, and in some cases, bankruptcies. Um, Belo is obviously a bright spot and shows the huge impact in your region, like we just heard. But I'd love to hear how you protect your business from these macroeconomic effects and also the consumer sentiment. Um, do you have any like point of view right now or also, you know, no one can predict anything, but like, where do you see crypto going? Yeah, so uh, it's, um, I'm quite biased on this and that's kind of the hard part of, you know, being, or running this type of business in this type of industry. Um, I think that in general, I mean, when we see all the different, you know, um, things that have happened over the last couple of months or years, um, I see some, some cycles in which 
things tend to heal itself and we go back to you know normality uh in the good and in the bad sense so there was all these you know um uh, episodes with the with luna and terra which definitely uh were you know really bad because a lot of people lose a lot of money but on the other hand it's part of the you know r d process of crypto itself so we need to kind of um lose some soldiers in order to understand what you know fight we are fighting uh and it's the cost of innovation at some point i, I know it sounds kind of hard uh but it's i think the, the way it is um one interesting thing at least in in argentina which is right now where we are focusing is that the um, understanding or, or of you know i would say the, the broad uh, the broad market but at least um a segment a quite significant segment of the market it's understanding that you know most in in in, in the case of mostly stable coins uh are you know <clears throat> playing this role of crypto dollars which are you know they are relatives to you know um the the the, the us dollar so this this is a fun fact but argentina is the second country uh, in the world with the most dollar bills outside of uh, the, the US. So after really? the US, the most that. country in the world with US bills, it's Argentina. Uh, so that's kind of the, the let's say, the, um, the bias that we have for, you know, uh, saving harder money. Um, mm -hmm. The thing is that we are turning into a more, you know, free way of uh, accessing to finance because the government uh, is limiting the access to the, to the dollar because that provides a lot of pressure to, to the central bank. So people are flocking to crypto dollars, they're flocking to stable coins to start saving, to have you know, more options, more flexibility. And on the other hand, Argentina has been you know, always, I would say, um, one place that produced a lot of people really skilled into technology, which are you know, exporting services and are bringing you know, fresh dollars to the market. And that type of users, you know, gig economy in general <clears throat> are being, I mean, they are uh, acquaintance, I mean, to the whole concept of stable coins. And there is a lot of flux inflow of, of money coming from crypto. So I think there is kind of, um, I wouldn't say hyper Bitcoinization as a concept, but a normalization that crypto can be one, uh, also new way to do stuff. And it can be, you know, part of your day to day. And that's why I think, you know, Belo has, grown also so rapidly in the last in the last year um in, in terms of the macro of crypto i think um we are pretty much um aligned with this the the the, the bitcoin um um uh, halving which is the process in which you cut the 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 mission of the, of the new um, of crypto to 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 of Bitcoin to half of it, which happens every four years. So uh, I think that that happened last time in 2020. Next time will be 2024. So I think there's a, there's a cycle where we will see you know new maybe new new all time highs in in price, but this is just forecast. Um, so. You know th that cyclical part of the of the of the industry and and the and the market in general. I think it's, we are going to come back and it, and the, the problem with that with the hype with the new you know bull markets in general that um, works as an eraser on most people on past exp uh, on past experiences, uh, making them maybe commit new uh, bad decisions into the future. But I think it's part also of the, the psychology of humans in general, you know. We tried not to to learn too much. <laughs> so you're muted? Yeah, I think you're muted. Sorry, yes. We'll definitely follow the news and um, obviously we'll share everything about Belo, but um, definitely uh, not a boring time for crypto. Um, I know we're at time, but there was one question that I'd like to ask um, to all of you, maybe if you have one tip. Um, the question here was that 
uh, talking to the right investors, because Shail, you mentioned earlier that um, there are more VCs investing than there are founders. What is one tip from each of you of finding the right VC? Um, for me, I think it's research and leaning into your network. Um, I think that you have to be able, like this is, in, especially here, this is a relationship game. You have to build a relationship with people. You have to build trust with people, right? Especially as a lead investor, people that are going to set the terms for you around, that be the biggest check-in, you have to make sure that you are building a relationship with them and you understand their thesis and pain points. I think a lot of the times is, is not a fit. And you'll get these cold emails, it's just not the right time, it's just not the right fit, it's just not the right whatever. Not only do you have to find the right fund you have to find the right person within that fund as well so it's important because every partner in a fund has a different um has a different value that they bring in a different passion that they they bring in and what they're looking to contribute to their fund ultimately you have to understand as a founder that yes they're there to deploy capital they're also raising, they also have LPs, and they also have a thesis that they need to justify and support. So don't waste time on people. If someone tells you this isn't within my thesis, they're not saying try harder. They're saying this isn't within my thesis, right? Mm -hmm. Get to the quick no. I think mm -hmm. don't get dragged on. And I, who I feel like I have so much experience raising, still has fallen into that trap where VC sometimes tell you just enough to keep to keep the interest going, but they're not getting to that quick no. I think mm -hmm. one of the quickest things and the easiest way, easiest way to raise capital is to find the right connection in the match and to kind of push through the people that are just not going to work with your with your raise and what you're doing. Get to the quick no fast. It's okay. Yeah. Ask them flat out. Are you interested in investing? And if they're like, no, maybe next round. Thank you so much. I'll keep you informed in my quarterly emails. Move on. Right. It's a numbers game. Um, it's a numbers Alberto, game. Manu, do you have anything to add? Any other tips? Well, I can, yeah, sorry, Manu, go ahead. No, no, go, 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 go ahead, go ahead, please. After you. So, um, yeah, I think the, the, the main problem is when you don't have a network, you know? So building a network, I think it's one of the most important things as a founder, at least. Uh, and it takes a lot of time to do it. Um, one cool hack that I learned, uh, which I need to maybe apply a little bit more, it's reach out to VCs, not asking for money, but asking for um, advice, you know? And, and this uh, helps you connect and empathize with the person and maybe uh, go to, to the right place where you want to go, you know, and have that conversation. One thing that I, I heard yesterday is that when you are with a VC, you are on um, the same conditions and, she, and you need to uh, think of yourself as in the same line as the VC, that it's not that the VC is superior or you're superior. I mean, you are on, on a discussion for business and how you work around the, that conversation is super, super important. And one thing that I'm working a lot, and it's also, I think, a, a good feedback for founders overall, it's to structure the conversation in a way that it's easy to follow up because uh, sometimes I, I, I tend to be really creative and maybe a little bit chaotic uh, and it's like you know your desk uh, maybe you understand your mess but you need to be really uh, very structured to to let the others you know understand what you are trying to to communicate you know? yeah 100 percent Alberto anything to add from your end well, my, my two reflections, I think it's is important to have a structured process, uh, mm -hmm. especially in these times, it's important to have options and, and, and competition. And well, for when you have that, then you have a good outcome. If you have a good company, you have a put in process, a, a, a put in place a solid process, you, you'll have a good outcome. Uh, then uh, our first round was oversubscribed. This next uh, one is... Uh, gonna be or, uh, oversubscribed already and, and we have barely started why because we put these things in place right we have a good a real technology deep tech that does the job our customers are happy it's a good company 
we we put a pro, a good process in place and and gives you the outcome and then you need to choose when you have over subscription then you need to choose and and then it's not on money uh, actually in our first run i always say that we have three good bits in the valuation range that we were looking for we went with the lowest valuation that was the venture city because you could bring something that the others couldn't you know we love the fact that you are mostly former entrepreneurs former founders in software and you complemented us very well. You promised us a lot of things, Laura, but uh, see, you have delivered actually. Uh, and, and we are strong in the electricity world, but where we didn't know how to build a software company. And so you have avoided us very expensive mistakes that will have costed us more than the difference in, in valuation. So we're very glad with the decision. So I, I think that's a tip I will, I will give to entrepreneurs, you know, focus on having the right guys in the board, the right, uh, partners that will help you build your dream uh, through and, and valuation you know a million up or down or something you know it's, it's not gonna it's not gonna make the difference in in the end what's gonna make the difference is you have the right people or the wrong people as well exactly um love the shout out here and i love that you're saying you know like you need to deliver what you promise so keep us on our toes and i think that's another you know tip for all the founders like like shell said it's a relationship that is ongoing so you know make sure that it's coming from both sides yeah you would like to say something yeah i was just gonna you know especially in this market condition like that trust like alberto said that so well because when all this started happening at, in in the spring my first whatsapp was to andy and laura right like to be like hey let's think about this let's brainstorm what's going on to be mm -hmm. proactive to lean into your investors to don't go after them being like I'm screwed, go into them being like, this is my plan for how I want to do this. How can you help me? And to have that foresight and that ability to communicate is so important with investors because everyone's with you through the good times, right? Who's going to really be with you when shit is hitting the fan and you need help? Like that's the kind of people that you want on not just your team, but on your cap table, right? Focus on that importance and what value they're truly bringing to you because that's how you become a unicorn. Yeah. I think this was a great um, finishing statement. I know we're a few minutes um, above time. Uh, this was an amazing conversation from three really established founders in three regions. Um, the Venture City, we love a lot of the elements that you just touched on, like data, looking into really if your company is set up for growth. Uh, one last resource I would like to share with the audience is um, Growth Scanner, which is a tool that we recently launched for startups to um, get insights into your business health and make strategic decisions. So this is not just for our portfolio companies, so everyone who's here, um, but we now opened it for any company to check their current um, product health. So you know, feel free to test this out, um, reach out to us uh, and yeah, like keep building. We love this positive, all the positive messages from Alberto, Manu and Shell. So thanks so much, everyone. Um, have an amazing rest of the day, rest of the week. Um, and we'll stay in touch by email or our website. Thank you so much, everyone. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. See you. Bye. Bye.